let me set the stage for you. It's 1992 and I'm 23 years old. I'm traveling around Europe, waiting tables and having a great time with my buddy Matt McNair. I have recently completed my undergraduate degree at Washington University in St. Louis. By the way, Andrew, I did not get a full ride. <laughs> I'm earning a lucrative diploma in, of all things, <clears throat> philosophy. <laughs> I can imagine my parents' relief and excitement when I learned during my travels that I was accepted to UNL's College of Law. I'm sure they were relieved that I was on the right track, or some track, or any track. <laughs> well, not so fast. This is the part where I called my parents to tell them that I was deferring law school and instead was going to spend a year in Russia. At the time, Russia had recently been the Soviet Union, and uh, Russia was going, had recently been the Soviet Union, and it was going through a major economic and political meltdown. Needless to say, my parents had their doubts. They made it in tears on my mother's part. But in the end, my time in Russia ended up being one of the most incredible experiences of my life, and that is my story this evening. Some of you are too young to remember the Cold War, Glasnost, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Those of you who do remember will recall what a crazy time it was in world history. And nowhere was it crazier than Russia. A former world superpower where I was heading, not to visit, but to live and work. To give you an idea of the magnitude and severity of the collapse, Consider the Russian currency, the ruble. For decades before the fall of the Berlin Wall, the ruble was pegged at one ruble to one US dollar. Each of these two currencies basically buy the same goods and services. After the fall of the Soviet regime, the currency was no longer supported, manipulated, or fixed, and it floated relative to other currencies at its actual perceived value. Before I arrived on the scene, the ruble in the black market had already slid to 50 rubles to one dollar. Five zero, 50 to one. Imagine, from your American perspective, being able to buy one McDonald's hamburger with your dollar one day, and the next being able to buy 50 hamburgers with that same dollar. More dramatically and tragically from the Russian perspective, one day you could buy that same hamburger for one dollar, and the next it essentially cost you fifty dollars of your savings to buy that same hamburger. Simply put, Russian earning power and savings, retirement, etc., were eviscerated in months. With the ruble declining even further to one hundred rubles to one dollar by the time I arrived in Moscow, and declining to five hundred to one within months of my arrival. But let me go back a minute. How did this random Nebraskan with a philosophy degree end up in Moscow in the first place? My Russian experience <coughs> My Russian experience had, was initiated by the fact that one of my housemates from college had studied Russian and moved there after we graduated. After graduating from WashU, I decided I needed to take that obligatory year off before going to law school to travel. And while I was staying and waiting tables in London, my college friend Les came from Russia to visit and insisted I come stay with him in Moscow. So off I go. With no real preconceived idea of what's in store, and no idea that I'm about to have one of the most absurd, fantastic, and memorable experiences in my life. The gravity of what lay before me hit me the second I got off the train from Poland in Moscow. Bread lines, people selling beer, homemade beer, from the trunks of their cars to survive. My first nice meal cost me less than 50 cents. Shortly after my arrival, someone offered to sell me a rocket launcher, <laughs> as well as a laser so powerful that one could see its ray fixed on the surface of the moon with the naked eye. <laughs> really? really? 
<laughs> As you've already figured out, there was no way I was going back to England. Remember, I'm 23, 24 at this point. Instead of scrambling to get by in London, which is insanely expensive, by the way, I found a job in Russia making dollars, and my income was literally appreciating every single minute. Safe to say my lifestyle was about to change dramatically. Jobs were plentiful in Russia because if you had a Western work ethic and a college education, European and U.S. companies that were pouring into Russia at the time would hire you in a second. I found a job instantaneously working for a U.S. company that owned a newspaper and a television station. Absurdly, in addition to myself eventually becoming the editor-in-chief of the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> One of my jobs was doing voiceovers for television commercials at the TV station owned by my employer. Naturally, you might wonder, what the heck is an American doing on the airwaves in Moscow? At, the moment, at that moment in time, you have to remember Russians had no buying power given the collapse of the rule. Therefore, it was not uncommon for advertisers to broadcast and publish in English in hopes of reaching foreign diplomats with dollars to spend. And of course they spoke English, not to mention all the droves of Americans like myself and for instance English speaking Swedes that were living in Moscow at the time. So imagine us 20 something Americans and Europeans living in Moscow, getting paid in dollars, and exchanging those dollars on the black market to get the best rates. To give you an idea, I had to keep upgrading my ruble storage from my pockets to my backpack, to a drawer, to a cabinet. Stop stacks and stacks of ruble bills. <coughs> when I first arrived, I could afford a perfectly nice apartment. One month later, I could afford one of the nicest places in Moscow. The next month, I could afford a maid. Soon, a driver. Before long, a translator and a Russian tutor as well. Remember, I'm 23. Eventually, myself and a group of Americans and Europeans who also lived in Moscow were dining at some of the finest restaurants every night. In short order, the dinner for 10 at the nicest restaurant in town with five courses champagne, caviar, copious vodka, of course, cost $12 or less. I, of course, urged friends and family to visit. <laughs> I, I told them of the absurdity of hailing taxi cabs. And instead of finding an actual cab, being picked up by private citizens who were driving commandeered fire trucks and city buses who wanted to give us rides to our destinations. These impromptu cabs were driven by industrious Russians who were willing to go to extremes, of course, to earn a few dollars. American friends and family thought it was embellishing and really didn't believe it was so dramatic. Rest assured, it clicked for them when, for instance, my father and I were picked up by a driver and we found ourselves sitting next to each other in some oxygen tanks, firmly on a gurney. Yes, we've been picked up by an ambulance. <laughs> The scope started to really sink in when he and I were bar hopping around Moscow one evening, being chauffeured around town, alone, on a double, a double long city bus. This may have been about the time when my father began to understand why I needed to defer law school to experience this. The extremity of our situation and our newfound resources spawned creativity. Suddenly, visitors would come up with crazy ideas like going on the overnight train to St. Petersburg. But instead of buying a coach ticket, a first class ticket, or any ticket at all, the idea was to go directly to the conductor, give him a few dollars to exchange for what we call supreme class. Basically several private fancy cabins, having almost an entire train car to ourselves. It worked like a charm. The creativity expanded. I remember hosting a party with my father, former Lincoln Mayor Bill Harris, during his stay. We had rented an extra large apartment, especially for his two-month visit. It was Halloween, and of course, 
Russians are unfamiliar with our Halloween traditions and have no access to or money for costumes. Bill had the idea to go to the wardrobe department of the world-renowned Bolshoi <laughs> to see if their wardrobe clerk would be willing, off the books, to lend us 50 or so Halloween costumes. We filled a truck with these costumes, like sultans, pharaohs, musketeers, generally anything that you'd find in an opera. And we only spent 10 bucks. <laughs> Seeing everyone dressed up in these Bolshoi quality costumes was astonishing. It only got more ludicrous from there. Shall we go to Siberia? Let's go right now. Rent a plane and go parachuting? That will be one dollar, please. The stories go on and on. These sorts of outings were so common that we became immune to the bizarre. Eventually, we became almost blasé about trips we took to exotic places like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan. It was uneventful when one day we decided to make our way to Samarkand, Uzbekistan. The total cost of travel to Central Asia, as you might imagine, was predicted to be affordable. And we did not hesitate in avoiding the complications of reservations, ticket purchases, standing in line, going through security, etc. And we simply tracked down the pilot of our flight to Uzbekistan to give him a few bucks to see what would happen next. Not surprisingly, it only took 10 bucks to get several, several of us escorted directly to our Aeroflot flight, first class. We went through the side door, of course, no check in, no lines, no security. Our experiences in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan are another story entirely, perhaps for another episode of True Stories. But suffice it to say that our travel and accommodations in places all over Central Asia were always easy and top-notch, thanks to our backpacks full of rules. By the time I reluctantly left Russia, almost one year later, the ruble had collapsed to 3,000 to one US dollar. 3,000 to one. And no, I did not immediately come back to Nebraska as my parents had hoped, but instead, I traveled to work in Japan via the Trans-Mongolian Railway. Think Trans-Siberian Railway, but routed instead through Siberia and Mongolia. I bought the ticket that took me 5,700 miles in eight time zones, terminating in Beijing, China, for five dollars. Eventually, though, I did return, and I did get my law degree. I eventually managed to take, make something of myself, but needless to say, I never regretted that decision to defer law school. Thank you.